let's get started. Um, so uh, we're happy to have uh, Michal Feldman today, who is going to tell us about uh, profit and security online algorithms for matching in general graphs. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, very happy to visit Israel. Um, so you, you hear me well? No echo? Okay, great. So uh, yeah, like Siga said, I'm going to talk about uh, profit and secretary algorithms. I'll explain, if you don't know what these are, don't worry, I'll explain exactly what I mean. And most importantly, this is joint work with Tomer Ezra. Uh, I believe Tomer is here. So Tomer, feel free to jump in whenever you want to say something. Uh, and uh, Nick Gravin and Jihao Tang from uh, Shanghai University. So let me start by uh, some, type, some type of a game that I call the hitchhiking game, just to give you um, the, the feeling of these online, uh, online problems that I'm going to deal with. Uh, suppose, uh, you know, I'm in like near Oakland and they want to catch a ride to Yosemite and cars are starting to arrive and every car that arrives i'm asking uh, the driver where where are you getting and the first driver says i'm going to stockton and i'm like no this is too far from yosemite i'm waiting for the next car the next car is going to san jose this is even worse so of course i let it go and then maybe the next car um is going to groveland which is uh maybe good enough for me uh, i have to make a decision now whether I take this ride or not, without knowing what's going to happen in the future, right? So this is exactly the type of problems, the type of which are called online problems that I'm going to deal with. And yeah, maybe I take this uh, ride and uh, I, I, I cannot know that the next car would go directly to Yosemite, but I missed it. I, I made decisions based on partial information. And this type of problems, uh, each one of us encounter them every time, right? When we need to decide about the job offer we get, uh, a ride, maybe we need to choose a secretary or a PhD student or an Airbnb apartment or even a partner for life, right? I mean, we choose one, who knows, maybe a better one will arrive um, next week. But anyway, we need to make a decision at some point. So in this talk, I'm going to talk to present first the very basic uh, scenario that is called optimal stopping theory, where we need to choose a single element in an online fashion. And I'm going to introduce two settings. One is called profit based on profit inequalities and one is secretary. Very, very well known um, settings that date back to the um, early previous century. A more uh, current work is I'm going to extend these settings to matching in graphs. I'm going to show you some background uh, from previous work about that is called one-sided matching in bipartite graphs. And then, only then, so I'm going to, to, to spend a lot of time on background because I think, as always, this is more interesting and important just to get to know these settings and to know the the results from the literature. And only then I'm going to get to our contribution, which is generalizing this uh, from matching in, in one-sided bipartite graphs to matching in general graphs. Okay, so this is going to be the outline. So the first half will be just background and the second half will be about our work. Okay, so optimal stopping theory. We have a sequence of N values, V1 to Vn. Initially, they are unknown. And then they start to arrive online, one per round. So maybe the first run is 1,000 and I need to decide whether I stop now, right? This is optimal stopping theory. If I stop now, I keep the $1,000 and the game ends, okay? I never know what's going to happen in the future. I go home with $1,000. I can also decide not to take the $1,000 and to continue the game in which case this prize is lost forever and the game continues with the next box. Okay, so like this is the type of things you see usually in reality shows, right? You can, you answer uh, a question correctly, 
and you either take the 20,000 prize and go home or you continue to the next phase, which maybe has a higher prize, but who knows what the question is going to be. So this is exactly the, the setting I'm talking about. So maybe the next one, so I didn't take the 1,000, maybe the next one is $4, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right, so who knows what's going to happen next. And it's not too difficult to see that in the absence of additional information, if the setting is really this adversarial setting that I showed you, that the adversary chooses both the values and the order of arrival, not much can be guaranteed. So essentially, you can choose a random algorithm that uh, you know chooses a random uh, uh, a random uh, prize, and then you get only one over n of the optimum and you cannot do better than this, than order n. And of course, what we want to do, we want to do much better than order n. Hopefully, I mean, the, the hope is to get a constant approximation to the optimal price. So now what's playing for us? Uh, there are two different settings. In each one, something else is playing for us. First setting, which I'm going to call profit throughout this talk. And whenever you see this figure, this uh, woman, uh, She's a prophet, so you know that I'm talking about the prophet setting. In this setting, what's playing for us is that that values are not just completely adversarial, they are drawn from known distributions. I know the distributions they are drawn from, and I can base my algorithm on these distributions, and the order is worst case. The other setting is called secretary. So this, this picture here is secretary. Uh, what's playing for us in a secretary setting is that the arrival order is random. So you can think about an, ar an adversary who is choosing values adversarially, but then these values are reshuffled and they arrive in a random order. And that's what's playing for us. So in, as we will see later, in each one of these settings, we can take advantage of the extra information we get. In profit, the extra information is the underlying distribution, which is known. And in the secretary, um, the additional information is that they arrive in a random order. Okay? Since you are, since, uh, just, just to make a comment, there is another variant. I think it's called, it's not called Google, but some variant on the name Google, Google, yeah, Google go, go, or something. Go. Where, yes, where you are allowed to use the values themselves so it's a variant of the secretary where you only use the rank. Uh, there you are also allowed to use the value. And it's a much more difficult problem, but as far as, if I remember correctly, it's been solved by some Russian guy or something. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, so, right. Yeah, I think it's called, the, it's Google, like, like this huge number. And the setting- like Google Plex, like Google Plex, except for the Plex, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, uh, okay, so let's now be a bit more formal. We have n values, v1 to vn. They arrive online in some order pi. And the algorithm is a possibly randomized stopping policy. Um, let's denote by alg v pi the value accepted by alg on the sequence v under the arrival order pi. And the opt v is just the maximum value of the sequence. This is what I want to get. And uh, the competitive ratio, and this is the performance measure that I'm going to use th throughout this talk, the competitive ratio is the performance of the algorithm uh, divided by the performance of opt. And I want, of course, to maximize this competitive ratio. I want to get as, as close as possible to one, as close as possible to the maximal value. Okay, and now for each one of these settings, we can formally define what we mean by this uh, competitive ratio. Uh, in the profit, as we said, we know the distribution and we take the expected performance of the algorithm divided by the expected performance of opt, and we take the worst case order of that the adversary can choose. And in the secretary, we take again the expected performance of the algorithm divided by opt, and we take the worst case sequence that the adversary can choose. Okay, so these are the two settings. And um, if there are no further questions, um, I suggest that we just uh, play. Okay, so I'm going to play this game with you. This is the profit game, right? You see this picture, you know that it's a profit. 
It means, and, and let, let me make it even easier for you. Let's say you even know the, the order, the arrival order, okay? So you know, oops. Uh, okay, there was some, um, can you see the slides final? Okay, so you know that the first value is drawn, oops. <laughs> you know that the first value is drawn um, from uniform 2040, the second one also uniform 2040, then uniform 1050, and then uniform 10, uh, 070. By the way, it's not necessarily uniform distribution, I just want to make it easy for you, okay? Right, okay, so let me tell you, the first price is 33. You can either take it and go home or continue, in which case this 33 is lost forever. So who takes the 33? I see Peter is taking the 33. I, unfortunately, I can't see all of you, but okay. If you took the 33, great, you go home with the 33. Everybody who didn't take the 33 stays for the next round. Okay, the next one is 22. Someone takes the 22, no one takes the 22. Yeah, it's a little frustrating because you could have taken the 33, but let's, let's be completely rational, right? We don't play. Uh, Given that you generated the sequence, it's clear that the right answer was to take the first one because you have constructed it for the talk. It's not a random sequence. So actually I, I, I have um, uh, a little script in the background that is drawing the values for me now randomly. No, not really. You're right, I constructed them, but you'll see. Okay, so the next value is 36. Okay, your value is taking 36. And ben is also taking, okay, great. So all of you took the 36. And now let's continue to the final one, it's 40. So everyone who, everyone who didn't take anything, now you go with 40, great. So you understand the, the game, right? This is the profit game. Okay, so now the interesting question, what can we do? What competitive ratios can we guarantee in these two settings? So many of you know that the best competitive ratio that can be obtained for the, this profit setting is one half. You can always do one half and you cannot do better than one half. And I'm talking here in the worst case. So worst case competitive ratio is exactly one half. And this goes back to the 70s. Um, and for secretary, uh, yeah, many of you know that the answer is one over E. You can always do one over E. And in the worst case, you can't do better. You can't do better than one over E. So we have tight results. How do we obtain them? How do the algorithms look like? So both of them are type well, of- uh, Sorry, Michal, one over E is not the probability of getting the maximum. Okay, great. So I- Which is uh, not what you defined as your competitive ratio. It's a different thing. Right, it's a different thing. In the classical setting, it is the same for both of these. Pro so great, yeah, I, I forgot to mention it. You can think of two different variants. One is what's the probability of choosing the maximal, the, what you want to maximize is the probability of choosing the maximal value. The second one is maximizing the expected value. Okay. And what the, remember. Divided by the maximum, divided by the maximum. Divided by the maximum. Remember the expectation of what you took divided by the maximum. Yeah, yeah, exactly the competitive ratio, this formula I showed you before. In the classical setting, one over E is the right answer for both variants. And the variant that I'm going to use in this talk is, is the expected value, okay? But remember this variant of maximizing the probability, it will come up later in the talk. Okay, so how do, how do the algorithms look like for the profit setting? So both of them are, are kind of threshold-based algorithms. In the profit setting, you pre-calculate a threshold tau. And but of course, you want what's playing for us in the profit setting, it's the underlying distributions that we know. So this threshold tau is calculated based on the known distribution. By the way, there is more than one way to choose the threshold in a way that will guarantee at least competitive ratio of half. And then, so you have this one number, one threshold, this is your whole strategy. And you simply accept the first value that exceeds tau. That's a very simple algorithm that gives you a guarantee of one half. And surprisingly, that's the best you can do. You could not do better than one half. 
in the secretary, the it's like in, in, in every secretary problem, it's uh, the algorithm is based on explore exploit. You first uh, observe some initial elements without accepting any of them. This is the exploration phase. Um, you take advantage of the fact that the uh, elements arrive in a random order. Then you set tau, the threshold, to be the highest value observed so far, and you accept the first value that exceeds tau. That's the algorithm that gives you a guarantee of one over e. Michal, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confused. I'm, uh, uh, one over e is the probability of getting the maximum. Now, if all the numbers are maximum minus epsilon, then I can get a competitive ratio close to one. Yes. So how so come it's still one over e? Something is not... Uh... Because we are taking the worst case, remember the adversary construction... Oh, the worst case of an all vectors v. Yes. Uh, I see. So the worst case of an all vectors v is when you make the maximum infinity and all the rest zero, essentially. And that's why it's a probability of getting the maximum. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, take that's the minimum it. over the sequence v. Yeah, so what I'm saying, you look at the sequence of the maximum is extremely much, much higher than anything else. So it's essentially the probability of getting the maximum. Anything else, exactly. else, else doesn't count. Yeah, I see. So that's why I get it. Okay, okay. Good. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this was the very basic setting. And now we get to the more complicated setting. It's very natural to consider more uh, like those combinatorial feasibility constraints. Those are settings where you don't want to take just one element, but maybe you want to take many elements. And the, um, the reward that we, you get is just the sum of the rewards of the elements you take. But there is some underlying feasibility constraints that tells you what sets you can take together, OK? And then the goal is to maximize the sum of the values of a feasible set. So the game is that in, a, in every point in time, a new element arrives. You have to decide whether to take it or not. And at all points uh, throughout the algorithm, you must ensure that what you took so, so far is a feasible subset, OK? And this problem has been studied for many types of uh, feasibility constraints, many types of matroids, uh, also beyond matroids, general downward closed constraints. And what's most interesting for this talk is matching in graphs. Matching in graphs is also, is, it's, it's beyond matroids. In fact, it's an intersection of two matroids, but it's not a matroid. Okay, so let's see uh, what do I mean by matching in graph. So matching in graphs, so first of all, it's a very fundamental model that has found numerous applications um, like, uh, like items and buyers in e-commerce applications, drivers and passengers, ad slots and advertisers, jobs and workers, et cetera, et cetera. In many electronic marketplaces, we want to match uh, elements. And this matching in graph problem, like this online matching in graph, comes in two flavors. One is edge arrival model. Uh, let me just say in, two, in both flavors, the elements are the edges. We want the elements are the edges. And we want to choose matching a subset of the edges of the edges that form a matching that maximize the sum of the value, right? We want to maximize the total weight of the chosen matching. Okay, one version is edge arrival, where every element, every edge arrives. Once it's arrived, we need to decide whether we take it or not. And the other version, which is going to be the focus of this talk, is vertex arrival. In this version, in the vertex arrival version, um, every time a vertex arrives, and when the vertex arrives, you see the weights of all of its edges from for uh, two previous vertices. Okay, so one way to think about it is kind of a batched model where elements do not arrive one by one, but they arrive in batches, and they arrive in batches like. Every time the batch that you see, the batch of edges you see is the edges that are coming out of the vertex that arrives. Let's see an example. So now let me introduce you the one-sided matching in bipartite graphs. So we have, and, and now I'm going to concentrate on the profit model, meaning that we know the underlying distribution of each edge. And let's assume that everything is independently drawn. Okay, so we have a, a bipartite graph. We have one static side. Let's say the items are always in the market. They are static. 
and we have uh, a dynamic side. The left side is dynamic. These are the agents that arrive dynamically to my market. And every edge has some weight WE, which is unknown. I don't know the weight. What I do know is that underlying distribution, and these are all independent, that the weight is coming from. Okay, good. Now, upon arrival of a vertex V from the dynamic side, from L, the weights of its edges are revealed. For example, suppose this vertex arrives first. Now we get to see the weights the realized weights of the edges coming out of the vertex one. And we need to decide whether we match one or not. And if so, to whom? Okay, so what would you do? So now we get the feeling it's already a slightly more complicated problem than just choosing a single element. It's, you know, it's a matching and we need to take care of many things. And let's say the algorithm decides to choose uh, this edge of seven, and then the next vertex arrives, and we get to see the realization. Okay, so now we regret taking seven because nine is greater, but we already made a decision. And then the last vertex arrives, we see the realization, and we make a decision. So in this case, the algorithm got us a value of 8.6, seven and 1.6. We could have done better. We could have taken off, if like in the offline version, we could have taken the edges of weights 9 and 1.6. Okay, this is one-sided matching in bipartite graph. So of course the question, what can you do? So we know that in the classic setting, in the profit version, we get one half, in the secretary version, we get one E. What happens in the one-sided matching uh, for these problems? So first of all, we showed that uh, for in the profit setting, we can also do one half. Of course, we cannot do better than one half. Even in the classic setting, we cannot do better than one half. Um, and in the secretary problem, there is a beautiful paper by Kesselheim et al from 2013, who also get one over E for this matching problem a secretary version. Okay, so essentially we get exactly the same competitive ratios uh, like in the classic setting. What about, uh, what algorithms achieve these results? So the very nice thing is that in both cases, the algorithms that achieve these tight bounds of one half and one over E are essentially generalization of the original algorithm. So the original al algorithm can be viewed as a special case of the algorithms in both cases. So for the profit version, the algorithm works as follows. So remember, we have this dynamic side and we have this static side. So for each item, for each vertex in the static side, we calculate a price. So I want to view it as a market, really like items and buyers. We calculate a price. This is the threshold for each vertex in the right size. This price is calculated based on the underlying distribution that I know. Then uh, when a vertex from the left side, from the dynamic side arrives, we match it to the most preferable item based on this utility function. So if an agent takes some uh, item for a, some item V or a U, what it get is the value. We can think about the weight on the edges, the value of this agent to this item, and it has to pay the cost of this item. And every agent just maximizes its utility. Okay, so if there exists an item that such that this utility is positive, then the agent chooses this item and it chooses the optimal vertex. And apparently uh, there is a way to calculate these prices, a very natural way to calculate these prices so that we are guaranteed to have a competitive ratio of one half. Okay, and this is the best we can do. And convince yourself that this is a generalization of the original algorithm. In the secretary version, the following algorithm gives one over E, a competitive ratio of one over E. 
we first observe some initial elements. So remember, we have this dynamic side, vertices arrive, we observe the weights, we don't do anything, we don't do any matching. Then at some point, at each round after the exploration phase, we consider the optimal offline solution on everything that we have observed so far. So we take the entire, like all the vertices on the right side and those vertices on the left side that arrived already, we see the graph, the induced graph on these vertices. This, this is the input we already observed. We compute the optimal matching on this partial graph and we match the arriving vertex to its partner if its partner is available. Okay? And again, you can convince yourself that the original algorithm is just a special case of this more complicated algorithm where we have only one static vertex on one side and everything else arrives online. Okay. Good Good. question, if I may? Yes, of course. In the secretary version, do we also as we do we also know that like some vertices might not be connected to other vertices? Like we don't assume that it's a full bipart. It's not a full bipartite, and we have we don't know anything. Okay. We don't know the values. Okay, you can think about non-existing edges as edges with value zero, and we don't know it. Okay, good. So we have this one half and one over e. And by the way, uh, some of you may know that the best exploration time is one over e times n. The right, the right time to wait before making decisions in the secretary version is uh, uh, one over e fraction. This gives us the one over e. Okay, and now uh, our contribution begins. So we have these beautiful results about, uh, you know, we have the classical results, which are really uh, amazing, one half and one over e then we were able to extend those to one-sided bipartite matching. And of course, the next natural question is what happens more generally. For example, maybe we have a bipartite graphs and it's more realistic to assume that we don't have one static side and one dynamic side, maybe vertices arrive from both sides, right? For example, uh, in ride sharing platforms, drivers and passengers arrive and there is no reason to assume that one side is static. So this is two-sided bipartite matching. And more generally, there is no reason to assume at all that the underlying graph is bipartite. Maybe, you know, we have some exchange markets where any two vertices can match. So the underlying graph is just a general graph. And now we want to do matching in general graphs. Okay, and this is exactly the problem that we study. Okay. So this is the table that we had so far. We had one half, one half for profit, one over E, one over E for secretary. And the next question is what happens in general graphs? Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Okay, good. So let me just make sure what the model is. So in my model, we have a general graph, uh, it's vertex arrival, vertices arrive online. Every time a vertex arrive, we see the weights on all of its edges, two previous vertices that already arrived. And we have to make a decision whether we match the newly arriving vertex to any previous vertex. Okay. So uh, let's see what we've got. So first of all, the first result, even in this more general setting, we can do one half, even for general graphs, okay? What's interesting here is that we could not generalize the more standard approach for profit. The more standard approach, I mean like the threshold uh, based approach playing in the value space some attempts of us to generalize these approaches did not result in one half. We could get one quarter or maybe slightly more than one quarter, but we could not get one half. So we turned to a different approach, which I'll describe you later, that is more playing in the probability space, not in the value space. And this is the algorithm that uh, got us to one half. Okay, 
this was a paper from last year. And then of course, um, we were so happy to get the one half and we had this nice evolution for profit. We get one half for classic, we get one half for bipartite and then we get one half for general. So then the next, uh, the next goal of course is what? What did we want to, what's the best case scenario here? For general graph secretary? One over eight. Yeah, of course. So what we wanted to get is, so that the question that um, we wanted to explore is whether we can do one over E for general graphs in a secretary setting. Okay, so uh, maybe now uh, let me take this uh, poll. Can you see the poll? Okay, so what do you think the competitive ratio of secretary matching on general graphs? Okay, I'll give you another 10 seconds. Okay, let me end the polling. Um, and share results. I think it's the first time I'm doing this poll in Zoom. Do, can you see it? Does it work? Okay, great. Okay, so the majority thinks it's worth, worse than one over E. Some, some of you think it's exactly one over E. Yeah, this was our goal. And then some of you think, uh, six people think it's better than one over E. So maybe someone who thinks it's better than one over E, can you speak up? Can you explain why you think it's better than one over E? Otherwise, you wouldn't have asked this question. Of course, right. So from the from my intonation, uh, you know that it's better than one over e, and indeed it's better than one over e. And the answer is five over twelve. Now this got us, of course, very excited. So we came up with an algorithm for this, and we got five over twelve. And um, not only we got five over 12, we could later show that five over 12 is the result. It's a tight result. You cannot get better than five over 12 for this problem. So this is very exciting for us because this is a new number in all these, you know, profit secretary problems. We are very used to one half, to one over E, to one minus one over E, if you're familiar with the KVV online matching model, et cetera, et cetera. This five over 12 is a new number. And this is the, this is the right number for uh, the, this, this, Amos? This means that, it, that matching in general graphs, yes, this is that matching in general graphs is not a generalization of one-sided matching in bipartite graphs. Because exactly. that, as a worst case, you could, you could have one-sided matching. Exactly. So this means that um, that this means that one-sided matching in bipartite graph is not a special case of matching in general graphs. So how come? So you can see. So let's see the evolution. So in the classic secretary, we get one over e. In the one-sided matching, we can encode this one over e worst case in this setting where we have this uh, orange static node and all these nodes arrive in a random order, this is exactly the classic setting. So we know we cannot do better than one over E. However, when we go to general graphs or to two-sided where vertices, all vertices arrive in a random order, this example does not uh, encode the classical example anymore because this vertex may arrive sometime throughout the process. And when it arrives, we have a lot of information. So we, we, we can do much better than one over E in this example, in the random arrival order. So this is because we, have, we are doing random arrival order, matching in general graphs is not a gener generalization of one-sided matching in bipartite graphs. And therefore we can do better than one over E. In some sense, Michal, in some sense, the number, the, you have many more degrees of freedom. It's like n squared 
in the general matching versus n in the by I mean n over two whatever I mean I'm ignoring constants yes it's like a factor of n uh, more what? because the number of edges number of edges now is n n choose two previously it was n over two let's say it was a balanced one or something uh, so so you have many more now it's true that you are still doing it relative to the optimum which doesn't prove anything but right. somehow it shows that it's a much richer problem. Yes, I, I, I agree. So there are many ways to look at it. And I agree that, I mean, what you said can go in both directions. And originally, we didn't know in what direction it would go. But, um, but it's true that it's a much richer problem. And uh, that's what made us very interested in this problem. Um, OK, good. So let me show you now um, how we got just, this. Just one question. So is there half? A, a bound that you found is it tight? Uh, this half, the half bound for the profit. Ah, okay, okay. good. So, uh, so who asks this? I can. Oh, Galia, can you answer the question? Maybe you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> of course, oh, the. Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Okay, so I, so the answer is yes. It's tight. And you can observe that in the profit version of the problem, one-sided matching is a special case of general graphs, because you can always think about, uh, you can always encode that the, if, if this, this one half is tight, and you can always encode the instance that gives you this one half in this version, because you can make sure that, the, um, that one side is static, this is the, the this is the set that will arrive first, so you see nothing, and then the dynamic side arrives, so you can encode exactly the instance that gives you a half here. So, in other words, here you cannot hope to get better than one half, and indeed we get one half. In contrast, here you can hope to get better than one over e, and we get better than one over e. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, any other questions? So, Michal, uh, so this is in the model in which all the edges that are connected to the node are revealed together or, or the edges are revealed one by one? So this is the version where all the edges are revealed together, but only to previous vertices, to only to vertices that already arrived. I see. Okay. And this is what we call the batched model. And by the way, in the paper, we, we, we um, give a more general framework of profit inequality, for example, with batched arrivals. So, you, so instead of elements arriving one by one, they arrive in batches. Now, the question is, what's a natural batching model? In, in graph matching, there is a very natural interpretation of batches. These are just the edges going from the arriving vertex. So, Michal, now, now I'm confused because I thought I understand, but now uh, given your answer, so I'm missing something. So, assume you take the one sided graph, you first, uh, you make all the edges uh, that are on, on left side or right side equal zero. Okay? All the, all, the all the edges that connect two points, two vertices on the left side, they are worth zero. All the edges that connect two vertices on the right side equal zero. And you reveal them one by one, first the left side, then the right side. So why does it give you anything? How can it give you more than a half? In what version? Profit or? In the secretary, in the secretary, in the secretary. In the secretary? So I mean, the same argument. So what's wrong with the same argument applied to the secretary, where again, you are defining, you are not allowing to choose things that go beyond the bipartite, okay? Uh, because you are defining all the other edges equals zero. Uh, uh, I'm assuming that all the weights are positive. There is a lower bound, right? I mean, you yes. didn't say that, but I'm taking this as uh, right. an assumption hidden someplace. Yes. Uh, so you do that, and you reveal first all the left side. No, but that, that you cannot you cannot decide the order. That's exactly the point. The arrival order is random, and this is exactly the point. Oh, the arrival order. That's the secretary. Oh, I see. Okay. So in the secret, sorry, in the profit the arrival order is not random. Exactly. It's a n-tuple of distributions. I see. Okay. Okay. So that's what I was missing. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Got it. Okay. So, so 
מיכל, in the case in which edges are revealed one by one, then the one over E still holds? Yes, correct. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so indeed, so uh, what Moshe asked is what about edge arrival model? And this is exactly what you see here. I'm not going to talk about it in this talk, but in the paper, we improve the results known for edge arrival. So previously it was known that one third can be obtained for profit and we improve it slightly to 1.2.337. Um, and in the secretary version, so like Moshe said, we, the one over E upper bound now does hold. We cannot do better than one over E because this is just, you know, that the, the real, the real uh, uh, online version where elements arrive one by one. And what we do is we improve the previous results of one over two E to one four. But I'm not going to talk about these results in this talk, okay? So in this talk, I'm going to uh, focus on vertex arrival. Michal? Yes. The uh, graph itself is uh, known ahead of time, right? Before the, the actual samples are, are drawn online. So in the profit version, you know, the, you know, the, you know all the underlying distributions. So, so you have all the, all the information, all the Bayesian information up front. In the, in the secretary, you know nothing. You just know that the arrival order is random. But the architecture of the graph itself, like what edges might appear and what edges might not appear, do so we know that? Um, so like I said before, it's not really important because weights can be zero and then you can think about it as non-existing uh, edges. Yeah, we, we do assume that we, we, we know the number of vertices. We need to know the number of vertices. Yeah. And so, in the edge arrival, the number of edges. So is it possible that to get a graph where I know that you know the the um, the algorithms that you showed maybe there's a better algorithm because I know the graph architecture ahead of time or I know the zero weights ahead of time and so maybe I can use a different strategy that gives me a better bound does that make sense? Um... So the bad example that shows that you cannot achieve better than five over twelve is a full graph. Yes, it's uh, okay. So let me let me comment on this. Right. So in the example that uh, the example, and I'll, I'm going to show to you. Hopefully, we'll have time. The example that shows that you cannot do better than five over twelve is a clique. Um, I think it's not. Uh, we didn't prove it yet, but we have uh, a very strong conjecture that this five over 12 also applies to bipartite graphs with two-sided arrival. Okay, good. So let's now see some algorithms uh, to, to have some meat to the talk. Um, so let's start with profit matching. So let me remind you in profit matching, we know that we have the underlying graph and we know the underlying distribution of every edge in the graph. Okay, for example, so let me, when I show you the algorithm, let's take a running example, this graph here, uh, where we have just a triangle and every edge's weight, the weight of every edge is drawn randomly from the uniform distribution zero three. Okay, so how does the algorithm work? So we have some pre-calculation. We first calculate Xe, which is the probability that E, that the edge E appears in OPT. For example, in this case, everything is symmetric. So Xe is one third for all edges E. Okay. Now the vertices start to arrive in an online manner. So the first, uh, the first vertex arrive, we observe all the edges to previous vertices. In this case, we don't have previous vertices. So let's go directly to the second vertex. Upon the arrival of the second vertex, let's have some notation. BV is the batch of V. These are the edges, the new edges, the edges that are going from the new vertex V to former vertices. In this case, the former vertex is one, so this is B of two, the batch of two. And minus BV is the red edges are all other edges. So upon the arrival of the vertex V, we observe the weights on the blue edges, 
those are the new edges. We get to see them, we know the realization. And our algorithm samples fresh samples from the distribution of all other edges. So for example, in this case, maybe we see the realization of the blue edge to be two, and we sample some weights for the all other edges, for the other two edges, okay? And then we compute the maximum weighted matching on this graph with these edges. So remember, we have the real weight on the new edges, and we have sampled weight on the other edges. You can see now that we really very heavily use the underlying, the, the, the extra information that we have in the profit version, the underlying distribution. We take advantage of it use with the sampling. We compute the max weight matching. Here, this is the maximum weight matching. And let u be the partner of v. So in this case, v is two and one is the partner. And then we do the following. Okay, so first of all, let me tell you what I want to do. I want to say, okay, if this new vertex V has a partner and this partner is a valid partner, meaning it's a vertex that already arrived in the past, then I want to match it. Okay, so this is, this is almost true, but not quite. So first of all, it's not clear that this uh, previous vertex is available. Maybe it was already matched before. So I have to add this extra condition if U is available. And then the trick that we are doing, and this is the, the core of the algorithm, is that we don't always match, even if it has a partner and the partner is available, we don't always match it. We do some hedging. We only match it with some probability. What's this probability? This probability is doing some hedging to make sure that vertices are available in future runs in future uh, periods of the algorithms with sufficiently high probability. And we'll see in the analysis exactly what I mean by this. Okay, so here I can compute and this alpha uv is a function of these parameters of this variable x that I pre-calculated here. Okay, and these are never updated throughout the algorithm. Okay, so in this case, I match to one. So indeed one is available. It's a previous vertex and I match it with probability one half, okay? So maybe, you know, I didn't match it because I only match it with probability one half. And then the next vertex arrive. Again, I get to see the realization of the new batch, all edges going from this new vertex to previous vertices. We sample the weight of the other edge. We compute the maximum weight matching here and we match it this time with probability three over five. Okay, so maybe we match it. This is the whole algorithm. So again, let me just repeat. Every time a vertex arrive, I see the realization of the new edges. I sample all other edges. I compute the max weight matching on the obtained weights, on the obtained graph. And then if the partner exists and is available, I match it with some probability. Uh, can I ask something? Yes. Uh, when you do probabilistic uh, choice, mm -hmm. you must be different between what you get now and the expectation of the future, right? Like uh, yeah, I, I so, don't have discounting if this is what you're asking. No, 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 it's, uh, no, no. What I'm saying, I mean, uh, the future is unknown, but uh, there is a, uh, there is a random variable, there are random variables there. You compute the expectation of what the algorithm is going to give you from next step on if you don't yes. match it. Yes. And you must, it must be equal, right? right? Because if it's not equal, you'll, you'll for sure go with a continuation. Ah. So why do you, so uh, if it's equal, why does it matter? Why do you really need the randomization? I mean, there is here non-linearity here. There is some con concavity or something or, or why the randomization gives you more. Because if you are indifferent, it wouldn't matter. I can choose that or that, it's the same. So what's going on? I'm missing something. So you are asking if this uh, algorithm can be de-randomized uh, in a sense? Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, let, let, me, let, let me get back to this point later, okay? Okay. And, and maybe, okay, we discussed it. Maybe, maybe actually Tomer can also uh, help with this question, but let me, let me defer it to the end. Okay. okay? Um, 
Okay. You are the prophet. You are the prophet here. Good question. I'm the prophet and the secretary in this case. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Ah, by the way, one thing I didn't tell you is that this alpha UV is a valid probability because this, what we have here in the denominator is the sum over X RU. And um, because we have a matching, we know that this sum is at most one. Okay, so this is a valid algorithm. So, uh, Michal, do you, sorry, do you assume that there is only one uh, maximum um, uh, weight matching? So this opt is, uh, wh wh what does it mean, the probability that E is in opt? So there, uh, may, be, uh, there, there may be more than one. Uh, we can, as, so we just have to, to break ties somehow. Uh, uh, okay. 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 Generically, so, generically, it's unique. Sorry? Generically, it is unique. And if your random variables are continuous, for sure, it's probably too yeah, we can. Yeah, we can also just do uh, this assumption. Okay, so some remarks. This algorithm is similar in spirit to, to Kesselheim's algorithm for secretary. Remember, this is an algorithm for profit. This is quite di different than algorithms that we, that we know for profit in matching. Uh, it's more similar to secretary matching. And this is a nice thing in a way, this work is kind of like merging the, the two worlds together. Um, but it's also different. So of course, in this version, we use very heavily the underlying distribution. And unlike Kesselheim's algorithm for secretary, in which if the partner is available, we always match it. In this case, we don't always match. We do this hedging. And now I'll show you the analysis to show you why we need this hedging. Okay. So um, let's suppose we are doing a slightly different algorithm in which if a partner exists, we always match it, okay? So, so suppose we do this, we see the new uh, values, we sample the other one, we compute the max weight matching, and then we just match it. Okay, of course, this is not valid. This is not always going to be a matching, but let's just suppose that we did this and let's call these edges the provisional edges, okay? So this is ignoring the fact that the partner may not be available and ignoring this uh, hedging that we did. And now the argument goes as follows. So first of all, because the way we are doing this sampling, the probability that some edge is provisional, that we want to match it, is exactly the probability that this edge is in opt. So this is exactly Xe. Now, using this lemma, we are going to the key lemma in our algorithm which is that the probability that E is indeed matched in the end in our real algorithm, not in this imaginary algorithm, but in the real algorithm, given that we want to match it, given that it's provisional, is exactly one half, okay? It's exactly one half. And now what plays for us is this alpha UV that we did. Okay, and the way to prove it is by induction. And now you see why we chose this, especially this alpha UV. This alpha UV that we chose is such that the pro for every edge E, the probability that it's matched given conditional on being provisional is exactly one half. And we do it by induction. So we can compute the probability that U is available. Here we use the induction hypothesis. And if it's available, we match it with probability alpha UV, and this product gives us exactly one half. And then a slightly more advanced version of lemma one is lemma three, showing that the expected value of the provisional edges is exactly equal to the expected value of opt. And together, we get the conclusion that we have exactly competitive ratio of one half. Okay, good. So this is a this is the profit, and now I want to spend um, a few minutes on secretary. Okay, so I remind you for secretary we are doing five over twelve. So I'll show you a bit of the lower bound. 
I mean the positive result, the algorithm that gives us 5 over 12, and then I'm also going to spend a few minutes showing you that one cannot get better than 5 over 12. Okay, so right, so this is the result I'm going to show you. Okay, so first of all, let me tell you what are the challenges going from bipartite graphs to general graphs. So in the one-sided bipartite graph, the way the analysis goes, and this is uh, what you would see in Kesselheim's paper, which I strongly encourage you to read, it's a really beautiful paper, is go it goes by establishing an upper bound on the probability that an offline vertex is matched. Okay, so we have, a, in, in one side, we have one, like the offline side, the static side, and we have the dynamic side. And the way the analysis goes is that we have an upper bound on the probability that this offline for every such offline vertex is matched. And this means that it's available with a sufficiently high probability. Now with general graphs like Sergio observed, this is a much richer setting. And we cannot use this trick because we have many non-monotone dependencies between matching probabilities of vertices. So we don't have this offline side that we just want to make sure it's available with sufficiently high probability. All the vertices are the same. They're all symmetric. They can be actively matched, meaning that when they arrive, they are matched to a previous vertex. And they can also be passively matched, meaning that some future vertex will arrive and be matched to them. So we have these non-monotone dependencies, which makes the whole analysis more, much more challenging. And um, what, we, what we found is that we're like setting upper bound does not suffice. And in order to deal with this problem, we compute the precise probability that a given vertex is matched. And the way we do it is by ensuring that in every step of the algorithm, the maximum matching is a perfect matching. And I'll show you how we do it. And this really makes the analysis easier because we, we like it gives us a lot of information about what's going on. Okay, so how do we do it? The algorithm is extremely simple. Uh, so okay, like like previous question, let's assume without loss of generality that the maximum matching is unique. Then we have an exploration phase. This is uh, the first n over two vertices that arrive. We just observe everything. We observe all the weights without doing anything. I want you to notice that in previous uh, secretary problems, the, the optimal exploration phase was one over E of N. And now we need uh, a longer exploration phase. We do uh, exploration phase of N over two, okay? So the first N over two vertices arrive, we do nothing. We just have a lot of information. We see a lot of weights. Then we go to the exploitation phase. Upon the arrival of vertex VT, so now is the trick that we make sure it's perfect matching. If T is odd, meaning that we do not have a perfect matching in the, in the current input, we choose a random vertex that arrived previously and throw it away. If it's even, then we do nothing. And then we find, we compute the max weight, max weight matching on the new, on the uh, current graph, okay? So on the current input, meaning all the vertices that arrived so far. And then if the partner of the new vertex is available, we match it. That's the whole algorithm. And this algorithm gives 5 over 12. OK, any question about the algorithm itself? OK, so um, good. So now the analysis. So the competitive ratio, the performance of ALG versus OPT. So the performance of ALG is just we sum over all times after the exploration phase. The exploration phase is K. I use it here with a parameter. That's how we did the analysis in order to find the optimal K. And for each such time T after the exploration phase, uh, we take the probability that indeed the partner is available and multiply it by expected weight of the new edge, okay? And now comes the part where I told you that we don't just have an upper bound on the probability that this partner is available. We can actually, in this model, in this algorithm, we can compute exactly as a function of T and K, we can compute exactly 
the probability that the partner is available. And of course, we heavily use the random arrival order here. And we can also uh, show that the expected weight of the new edge is at least this much. OK, this is not a difficult calculation. Let me skip uh, how we got to it. Then we get some, we do a lot of manipulation. We get some expression. And now we optimize for k. And we get that the optimal k is n over 2. This is the optimal exploration phase. And this gives us 5 over 12. OK, so this is the positive result. And then, so let me spend two minutes maybe on showing that you cannot, we cannot do better than 5 over 12. Um, OK, so like Tomer said before, this is the instance for which we show that we cannot do better than 5 over 12. We have the complete graph, a, a click. We associate every with every vertex we associate some natural number a unique natural number and the weight of each edge will be a big number it would be n to the power of three times lambda u plus lambda v okay lambda u and lambda v are the unique natural number associated with the two endpoints of the edge and the weight of the edge would be n to the three times the sum of those. And you'll see in a minute why we take this value. And then what we show is the following. OK, so we are, our game is in what's called the cardinal setting. So everything has value, vertices have value. Let's assume without loss of generality that the algorithm actually observed the vertices values, even though it observes the edge value. But just believe me, it's the same. OK, so in our cardinal setting, the vertices have values right? Every vertex is associated with some natural number. The algorithm observes those values. And the goal is to maximize the value, the expected value of the matching. OK. Now we show by a reduction that if we have an algorithm that gives us better than 5 over 12 for this cardinal setting, then we also have an algorithm that give us better than 5 over 12 in the ordinal setting. This ordinal setting, Sergio, is similar to what you said before in the classical secretary version. So this ordinal setting, vertices are just ranked. They're, they don't have value. They're just ranked from highest, second highest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What the algorithm observes upon arrival of a vertex is not valued, but just the relative ranking of everything that arrived so far. And now the goal is to maximize the probability of matching the top two vertices. OK, so vertices arrive. I see, OK, I'm saying this is the, the, the best one so far. Then the second one arrive. I know the relative order of these two. At some point, I need to make a decision. And what really I want to do is to maximize the probability to match the top two vertices. And what we show is that if we have an algorithm that gets 5 over 12 approximation here, we can also get 5 over 12 approximation here. The way we do, and then what we need to do is just to show that we cannot do 5 over 12 here. The way we show this reduction, it's not very simple, this reduction. And we we do it using a hybrid setting. So we first reduce the cardinal setting to the hybrid setting. What's this hybrid setting? In the hybrid setting, everything is valued, like in the cardinal setting. But the, prob but the goal is to maximize the probability of matching the top two vertices. Now, something like an easy observation is because the way we chose the weights, the n to the 3 times uh, the sum of the values, essentially what we want to do is to match the top two vertices. Otherwise, we can't do much. So we reduce the cardinal setting to the hybrid setting. And then using the infinite version of Ramsey theory theorem, we reduce the hybrid setting to the ordinal setting because we show that there is an infinite set of values for which the algorithm doesn't look at the values, only at the relative rank. So essentially, there is an, an infinite uh, set of uh, vertices for which the algorithm behaves exactly the same no matter what the values are, just based on ranks. OK, so this is the reduction. 
And now we only need to show that in this ordinal setting, we cannot do better than five over 12. And um, for the sake of time, let me skip the analysis. Um, we just, you know, do some calculation. Uh, by the way, apart from showing this uh, five over 12 upper bound, we also observe some properties of how the best algorithm looks like. Um, which is also kind of interesting, but uh, let me skip it and let me just summarize. So what we do in these papers is give tight results for matching in general graphs for both the secretary uh, setting and the profit setting. Um, surprisingly for us, so really our goal in the secretary, for example, was to match this one over E and um, and, and yeah, one like a nice observation is this one over E uh, is not our is not a, a limit for us and, and we could do better than one over E. We got the five over 12. Um, yeah, one thing that is, I don't know if I uh, mentioned it enough, but we do need for general graphs, at least for profit, we did need a new approach. We didn't use the threshold based approach uh, that was used in bipartite graph but we, um, we used what's sometimes called, those of you who are familiar, it's called OCRS approach. It's playing in the, in the space of probabilities. And um, yeah, so if you're looking for open problems, a, one thing that I didn't talk about is edge arrival. I just mentioned the result. There are some gaps here. So the results for vertex arrival are tight, but for edge arrival, there is still work to do. And another uh, interesting direction is to find truthful mechanisms for these problems. I should mention that in the one-sided uh, matching, I mentioned to you the algorithm by Kesselheim that finds one over E for one-sided matching. There was a follow-up paper by Rebecca, I forget how to pronounce her last name, unfortunately, uh, that gives a, a truthful mechanism changes this algorithm into a truthful mechanism that gives the same one over E bound, right? So the question is, can we also match the new um, bounds with a truthful mechanism? Thank you. Oh yeah, uh, thanks Michal. Um, so we are over time. So if you need to uh, leave, feel free. And uh, if you have any questions, um, 